All right, we're going to call our meeting to order with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're very happy tonight um, to be having our uh, oath of office and swearing in ceremony for our new town manager. And uh, to begin, we're going to have um, Father Tyone from St. Thomas More Parish, the pastor at St. Thomas More Parish, um, give a benediction to start off for us. So I'm going to call him to the podium. Father. Please be at peace, whatever your faith tradition might be. Almighty and eternal God, we humbly ask your blessing tonight upon our new town manager, James. We ask that his work and guidance of our town be fruitful, peaceful, productive. We also ask your blessing on all who work, govern, and sustain our community. We pray for harmony, unity, a gentle spirit of cooperation, right judgment, and ability. We also ask for a special blessing upon all our first responders especially Chief Corrigan for his shepherding of our town in these months and days, members of the Narragansett Police Department, Chief Partington, members of the Narragansett Fire Department. May all the residents of Narragansett and all who visit us find a serene, welcoming, and loving community. And we ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Father. All right, next I'm, we're going to um, have the swearing in. I'm going to ask um, James Tierney to go up to, I'll be at the podium. Please raise your right hand. I, James Tierney, I, James Tierney do, solemnly swear do solemnly swear that I will be true and faithful unto this state and support the laws and constitution thereof. The laws and constitution of the United States. The laws and constitution of the United States. The Narragansett Town Charter and Ordinances. The Narragansett Town Charter and Ordinances and that I will well and truly execute that I will well and truly execute the office of town manager the office of town manager for the term for which I have been appointed for the term for which I have been appointed or another or until another be engaged in my place or another be engaged in my place or until I'm legally discharged therefrom um, or until I am legally discharged therefrom so help me god so help me god congratulations And so now um, our new town manager uh, will be uh, will be addressing uh, will be addressing the um, community of Narragansett. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Welcome. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming this evening. I'm not much of a podium guy. I'd rather face the audience and the council because we're all part of the same community. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. Whether you came as a resident, actively participating in your community affairs, or whether you just came to see the new attraction under the big tent being me. Either way, it shows your interest in your community and support as we begin this new adventure together. I'd like to thank Chief Corrigan, first of all, for serving as the interim town manager and for working so closely with me during the transition period. I'm not done yet, Sean. He led the town the way he leads our police department, with integrity. His calm demeanor should be an example to everyone in this room. He is truly a gentleman. I also want to thank the town council for their unanimous support in selecting me. 
Coming into this role, the unanimous support was the only way that I would have stepped into this role. So no matter who you voted for on the council, we all need to recognize that they came together, they made a statement for the future of our town, a unanimous vote did not go unnoticed by our community. A little background for those of you who don't know me. I've been a taxpayer and a resident in Narragansett since 92. I worked as a police officer in South Kingstown for more than 28 years, and I loved every minute of it. I worked in patrol, detectives, and prosecution before retiring and taking a position with New York City as an inspector general. During my tenure with New York City, I oversaw some of the largest municipal agencies in the country, uncovering fraud, waste, and mismanagement within city agencies and vendors doing business with them. What I took away from that position was the importance of transparency in government and the importance of being guided by industry best standards to avoid, ev avoid even an appearance of impropriety. After completing my term in New York City, I accepted a position at RIPTA where I was immersed in the operations world for more than five and a half years. RIPTA is a statewide agency that serves so many communities and I found myself interacting daily with city and town officials, planning staff, finance, ridership, a diverse group of employees, employers seeking to find alternatives for their workforces to get to work, and the list goes on. When this opportunity as town manager presented itself, I saw the ad and I applied. I love this town and I know this might be the only opportunity to join this team of professionals and make a contribution to this community. I tell my brother I'm building my resume, he says it looks like you're building your obituary. <laughs> After presenting my cover letter and resume, I was interviewed and I was subject to a police background check. I'm so glad that I applied and I'm standing here this evening before you as your choice. I could say I'm as happy as a seagull with a french fry in Galilee, a place that holds so many great childhood memories to me. The outpouring of support from the folks in the community, the employees and the neighbors and the folks that used to work with me has been overwhelming and encouraging and I thank you. I won't let you down. In the course of business, I don't like to accept the word can't most of the time, as I often interpret that as won't. But in my meetings with our department heads, it appears that can't is not in their vocabulary. They've already impressed me as a dedicated, talented crew that can do and will do. This past weekend's events for Narragansett Days is a great example of what our employees are capable of. Thank you to each and every one of our employees and special thanks to Steve Wright and his staff from Recre Parks and Recreation who put the event together. Free helicopter rides, free uh, hot air balloons, and then uh, Mike DiCicco, DiCicco from DPW and his staff for the touch a truck that was attended by so many of the youth in the community. I attended both briefly and I was impressed. In closing, it's certainly not last. I mean, it is last but not least. I said this the night that I was approved for the position. I'll treat every member of this community with civility, courtesy, professionalism, and respect. All I ask is that you do that in return and pass it on. It is contagious. Together we can tackle anything and get to where is best for the town of Narragansett. Join me in showing Rhode Island that we're the show place. We're Narragansett. We love our community and we respect it and the people who live here. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So thank you um, to Mr. Tierney, our new town manager. We welcome him, and we were very happy um, that he agreed to, to join, um, to join uh, the town staff in this role, and it's already gotten off to a great start. And also thank you to Father Tyone for that benediction. I want, I, at this time, um, I welcome, on behalf of the town, um, Mr. Tierney to the position, but I want to see if there's anyone from the council that wanted to um, say anything. <laughs> Jim, I just want to say congratulations, and you have my condolences. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anyone else from the council? All right, is there anyone from the public? Yes. <clears throat> yes, please. <clears throat>
to the honorable members of the town council, I say congratulations on your choice of Jim Tierney for the position of town manager for the town of Narragansett. To members of the public and fellow Narragansett town residents, my name is Maria Mulroy and I am a local practicing attorney and I've known Jim in a professional capacity since the 1990s when he was a prosecution officer with the town of South Kingstown when I worked at the Attorney General's department. To Jim I say, success will come and go, but integrity is forever. To everyone else here I say, when I think of integrity, I think of Jim. This is because integrity means doing the right thing at all times and in all circumstances. It sometimes takes having the courage to do the right thing, no matter what the consequences will be. I have no doubt that Jim will be that person. I commend the council for this selection, as I know Jim will be a beacon of integrity and professionalism for our town going forward. Jim, as the great Robert F. Kennedy said, being a true Irishman, you'll appreciate this. Only those who dare to fall greatly can ever achieve greatly. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Good evening, members of the council, and I just did want to take this opportunity to say, um, my name is Teresa Tanzi, state representative, that I very much look forward to the relationship that we will build over the coming years, and if there's anything that um, I, myself, or Representative Hagen McEntee can do, um, we're available anytime. So welcome, and best of luck to you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Uh, yes, please. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Meredith Ashworth. I'm a resident in town and, as most of you know, a teacher of the high school. I welcome Jim for his innovative ideas in education, which we've discussed on many a level, pro and con, over the years. I think what sets him apart is not just his love of family and his love of this town and his respect for the law, but it's his empathy. He listens to people and he respects them, all of them. And so that listening should lead him pretty far as an, as an administrator. I think that's what's going to set this town forward. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. My name is Jack Donahue. I'm a chief of police in New York City. I come here to uh, congratulate you on the selection of your new town manager, and I'd like to say a few words about him. Uh, I've known Jim uh, for nearly 30 years, almost a lifetime. Some would say that's too long. But I would say, uh, from my experience, he's the man uh, best suited for this job. I did some Googling to find out what are good characteristics of a town manager, and I saw the words dedication, smart and trustworthy, come up. Uh, there's more to it, Jim, than just that. Um, it leads me to the question of, of why you hired him. And I can say that as a cop and as a supervisor, he demonstrated compassion for those he served. As the Inspector General, he earned respect in New York City for the people that he worked with and even for those that he investigated. And as the operations chief for RIPTA, he had to work closely with unions and with labor, and he was able to do so because in his time as a police officer, he was a union president. Which leads me to the conclusion uh, that he is the right person for you. One thing that's curious about, about Jim, um, he says when he's in a job and everything's running well and he's, he's comfortable, he seems to just get up and find a new challenge and get a new job. I know this in every jurisdiction in the city, uh, in, in the country, have challenges, and he's the man that's gonna lead Narragansett forward as your manager, and I congratulate you on choosing him. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you. Thank you, Chief.
All right, so thank you. And we also will be having a meet and greet on the 23rd, a week from tonight, at um, Kanach at North Beach Clubhouse at 6 p.m. to welcome um, uh, to welcome our new town manager. So what we're going to do right now is I want to um, take a five to ten minute break for um, pictures and congratulations. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> All right, if everyone can take their seats, please. We're going to call the meeting back to order. All right, so our next item is our consent agenda. Is there any item that anyone would like removed from the consent agenda? And is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion approved five to zero. And is there a motion, um, a motion to move an item? Yes, um, Matt, I'd like to move item number 15 to the top of the agenda, please. All right, is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All Aye. opposed? Aye. Motion approved five to zero. Item 15 is a motion to appoint Andrew H. Berg, Esquire, as assistant solicitor, and to appoint Melissa Larson, Esquire, as assistant solicitor. Is there a motion? Still moved. Second. Discussion? Um, this is, uh, as people know in town, Mark Davis is our solicitor. We have, as, uh, we also have a an assistant solicitor who's devoted to zoning and planning. And Mark's firm has been, is, was named the assistant solicitor, has been the assistant solicitor. There's three attorneys in Mark's firm who, and what they do is they focus on prosecutions at um, district court in Washington County and at municipal court. Unfortunately, the, um, well, fortunately, Andrew Berg has been serving in that capacity as our main, um, main prosecution's attorney. But Emil Martineau, who many on the council have met and interviewed last term, is no longer able to, to um, assist in that role. So we, are, um, we, have, um, we met with Melissa Larson, who has extensive prosecutorial, prosecutorial experience, and to be basically backup for um, Attorney Berg. So that's, um, that's, what, that's what this is, and we want to make sure that we um, have coverage for the town. All right. Is there any comment from the council? Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, just to clear, make sure everyone's totally clear on some of the wording in the motion. Uh, so basically what's happening, as Matt said, was that one attorney is, will be dropping off, one of our current attorneys is dropping off and we'll be bringing in a new attorney. So it's really a net wash in terms of um, the amount of attorneys and uh, in terms of cost, there'll be no additional cost to the town um, to, um, to bring on the new attorney um, as, a, as a new backup. So no additional cost and um, really the same number of attorneys uh, working for the town. Anyone else? All right, all in favor. Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion approved, five to zero. Welcome. Congratulations. Thank yeah. you. I'd like to move uh, item 13 to the front of the meeting, if that's possible. I move to. Is there a second? A uh, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion approved, five to zero. So this is item number 13. A motion to provide a decision on the waiver request submitted to the Sewer Policy Committee relative to following property, Plat D, Lot 210, 151 Ocean Road. Okay. So is there a motion? I'll move that motion. Second. Discussion. Um, so this is, uh, this comes to us, give me one second. So this came through from the Sewer Policy Committee, um, and we have, this is a property that many of you are familiar with on Ocean Road, across, um, uh, along the seawall. And um, what I'm gonna do is I'm first gonna ask, I know that we have a stenographer here, if the applicant or its attorney is here. Right. Good evening, Mr. Mannix, Mr. President, and uh, council members. Welcome back. Good to see you all. And Mr. Tierney, congratulations. 
I've seen a few of these things. I, I'm sorry to say, but it's very good for you. Congratulations. Um, uh, thank you again for the time tonight. James Callahan, um, Callahan and Callahan, 3 Brown Street in Wickford. We're here tonight uh, representing Atlantic East Limited and the property at 151 Ocean Road in Narragansett. Uh, it's a somewhat well-known property, I think. It's the grassy area at the corner of Congdon Street and Ocean Road uh, where the Atlantic East apartments are located. Uh, it's only a few blocks from Town Hall and uh, the Greenberg family, uh, the brothers Lon, Eric, Todd, and Gary own the property and they're seeking to uh, build uh, a new structure on that site. Um, the key aspect of this proposal is that there will be a new structure on site comprising of 22 new units uh, condominiums and the current 36 unit structure will be uh, converted to 34 units and they will be affordable. So of the 56 units that will be there hopefully in the end 16 will be affordable which is a 28.5 percent calculation. Um, basically this project is part of a comprehensive permit process which is designed by the state to allow uh, developers or anyone to propose affordable housing at, in town or any town in the state and streamline the process. Usually this would be in front of the planning board, but due to an ordinance in Narragansett, this permit process for the sewer policy waiver does not fall under the purview of the planning board. Uh, I think that's probably a discussion I may have to have at some later date but there, that is a quirky aspect to this situation. Um, basically, we need a waiver because, for the first instance, there's already a sewer connection for the current structures, uh, structure on site, but to get two connections for one lot, we need a waiver, among other reasons. Um, but basically, as part of the affordable aspect of this uh, proposal, which is low to moderate income housing, uh, we think we meet the requirements for the town to grant a waiver. Um, we've asked uh, engineer Jeff Cesarin to come tonight to discuss the waiver policy and ask him to uh, take the microphone at this point. Yep. Great, thank you. And just, sorry, before Jeff uh, uh, testifies, uh, I can go through his qualifications which you all know. Well, it's really not. Is it testimony per se, though? I mean, you have the steno for your purposes, but it's not really a public hearing, right, Terry? Yeah. yeah. I think so. Uh, but you definitely go through his qualifications. I think that's important. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Mr. Cesarin, you are an engineer? Yes, I am. And uh, you've been an engineer for at least 30 years? Yes. And you worked a town engineer in Narragansett for over three decades? Correct. And you're now <clears throat> retired? I am. And you've still kept your certifications? Yes, I'm still licensed as a professional engineer in Rhode Island. And as part of your role as an engineer, you've been involved in a myriad of projects in town? Yes. And that includes sewer installations? Yeah, uh, everything from sewer installations in neighborhoods that previously were unsewered to expansions and upgrades of treatment and conveyance systems. And almost any Department of Public Works property or project you were involved in? Yes. And. Um, you're also well aware of the sewer policy in Narragansett? Yes, I am. And were you partly an author of that policy? Yes. And uh, you also serve as the liaison to the sewer committee in Narragansett? That's correct. And um, again, you're still a licensed professional engineer? Yes. And what's your educational background? I have a bachelor's degree in engineering from Clarkson University. Um, and Mr. Mr. President and Mr. Solicitor asked that for the purpose of this hearing and for the uh, record that Mr. Cesarin be recognized as an expert in the field of engineering. I mean, again, I think you did that, but it's not technically a public <clears throat> hearing, as you know, so, but I think you've done that for you, you know, for your purpose. So noted. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, C-E-A-S-R-I-N-E. I probably should have done that first for you. Good evening. Good evening. It's nice to be back. <laughs> I've been retained by Atlantic East to look at the, how the sewer policy in Narragansett impacts the proposed project. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as part of my review, 
I reviewed the sewer policy, most notably the 2018 version, uh, the amendments that were made in May of 2018, as well as the amendments made in 2008. I also re reviewed some internal reports, uh, most of which I had prepared in my previous capacity as town engineer, uh, dealing with capacity issues at the regional plant. I also reviewed the, the um, development documents that Mike DeLuca had on the project. As Mr. Callahan said, procedurally, the applicant applied for sewer connections for an additional 22 units and was denied at the staff level. And that is the typical process and procedure. This, <clears throat> this led to an application to the town council for a hearing before the sewer policy committee. Two such hearings were held, one in June and one in August of this year. And the committee forwarded a split recommendation to you, which is why we are here this evening. Um, from a procedural standpoint first, I would offer the opinion that the waiver request process has been fully complied with the applicant. I don't see anything in there that's out of the ordinary or different than any other applicant that has come before you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Turning to the merits of the appeal, uh, my review of the documents have, has noted that the project that's proposed complies with the town's Affordable Housing Act and as such is eligible for an appeal of the sewer policy. That eligibility comes from 2008 policy amendments when there was a provision directly inserted for projects such as this. It was designed to give affordable housing projects the opportunity to qualify for a waiver of the sewer project. In 2018, the sewer policy was amended again to reflect a slight loosening of the capacity threshold that the town may impose. And this is an important consideration. Any capacity threshold that the town council uh, puts within a policy is essentially a self-imposed threshold and can be subject to waiver just like any other provision of the sewer policy. Uh, since the, and again from a procedural standpoint, since the adoption of the 2018 amendments of the sewer policy, which was when that 85% flow threshold was imposed, the sewer policy committee and subsequently the town council have heard 16 requests for sewer policy waivers. They've approved approved 15 of them. This is the only one that is still pending. So 15 in a row of approvals. Some of those have been for vacant land. Some of those were for developed land. Some of those had demonstrable hardships. Some did not. So I would just offer that up for your consideration as you evaluate the project before you this evening. And finally, on that note, none of the 15 prior approvals since May of 2008 have included an affordable housing component that's consistent with the goals of the town's affordable housing plan. A couple of uh, comments on the capacity issue. The town shares the regional treatment plant with the University of Rhode Island and, and the town of South Kingstown. South Kingstown is the managing partner. Each one of the three partners owns a share of capacity, and that was done through a series of intermunicipal agreements that date back into the 1970s when the plan was built. In the 1980s, Narragansett, in a, in a desire to expand sewered neighborhoods beyond uh, that which they had capacity for, entered into a lease agreement with the University of Rhode Island. URI had originally purchased more capacity than they needed. I think at the time, Obviously, I was not here in 73, but at the time, I believe the URI's focus was that they were going to build a number of dorms on campus that would require more capacity. That plan did not come to fruition, uh, so the town of Narragansett began leasing some of URI's unused flow space, and that gave us the capacity that we had to complete the North End Sewer Project and also to allow for what we call infill, uh, filling in of small gap areas within the sewer policy uh, where there are no sewer connections. The sewer policy divides the town into two pieces, that area serviced by the regional plant, which is the north end and the pier area, and that area serviced by the Scarborough treatment plant, which is everything south of Point Judith Country Club. So within the area serviced by the regional treatment plant, uh, the town has continually flirted with its capacity threshold, but always at a very conservative level. Prior to 2018, there was no stipulated level within the sewer policy. Uh, as a rule of thumb, at the staff level, we applied an 80% threshold, basically saying that when we approached 80% of the flow that we owned and used, then we would have to think about you know, some type of a policy amendment. What's important to realize through all of this, uh, and this is a 2019 number, the plant as a whole is only at about 54% of its capacity. 
So a project like this generating a little bit over 6,000 gallons a day is going to be several places to the right of the decimal point on that in terms of whether or not it has an, an impact on the ability of the regional treatment plant to assimilate this flow. Um, so in 2018, the Sewer Policy Committee and subsequently the Town Council elected to put a percentage in the sewer policy for the first time. And they chose 85% uh, in the theory being that the staff had been applying an 80% threshold. This would give us some room for growth for, for projects that warranted it. And that's where I got back to looking at the sewer policy waivers that have come before you since May of 2018. There have been 16 of them. 15 of them have been approved. This is the last one that's pending before you, unless something's come in within the last week or so. Um, so what I, would, what I would offer to you, I did promise to be brief, and this is brief for me. You know that. Um, the sewer policy waiver procedural process has been followed and fully complied with. The project is consistent with the town's affordable housing plan, which is a relevant criterion for a waiver as noted within the sewer policy. I believe the additional units can be assimilated within the flow at the treatment plant without any negligible impact. And the town, through the actions of the sewer policy committee and the town council, has shown a consistent pattern of approving sewer policy waiver requests since the 2018 amendments were passed some with or in some without demonstrable evidence of a hardship, and none of them with the affordable housing opportunity that this project offers. So with that in mind, my professional opinion would be to ask you for a positive recommendation for this project. Thank you. I'd just like to ask Mr. Cesarin just one or two other questions. Sure. Um, Mr. Cesarin, looking at that map, um, can you tell the council uh, or show approximately what area of that map is um, in that Congdon area, it's sewered? Uh, virtually all of it. The pier is sewered. Uh, there are, might be a few odd connections here and there, a lot here or there that doesn't have it. But in essence, everything from Sprague Bridge down to Earl's Court is, is sewered. There are, let's say, there are a couple little gaps in there, but the majority of it is sewered and has been. The pier represents the oldest area of sewers in town um, back to the 1880s. And uh, what is the facilities? Um, plan for wastewater management? That's a guidance document that the staff prepares and it's subject to approval by the State Department of Environmental Management. The facilities plan basically sets out everything from neighborhoods to be sewered to upgrades at, at treatment plants, uh, pump stations, conveying systems. It, it's essentially our version of the master plan for the sewer world. And can you explain what are the environmental benefits of a sewer versus some other system? Well, a sewer is a very closely monitored and regulated process. Um, you know, you've heard me use this analogy before. When, when people flush their toilet, they just want it to go away. They don't want to worry about where it goes. Well, with a sewer system, especially one um, that's professionally run and operated, um, you have that inherent environmental benefit. The sewer flow in the, regional, in the area of town that travels to the regional treatment plant uh, receives first class service. The regional treatment plant has been recognized by DEM and EPA for years for exemplary service. And the capacity at 85%, that's a self-imposed town policy. Yes, it is. And that's 85% of the capacity that we own and lease, not of the plant. And are you aware whether South Kingston has its own sewer policy? I do not believe that they have one. And they have no capacity regulation as far as we know? That's correct. And this is uh, would be privately funded or paid for by the proponents? Yes, including the what's called the I&I &I fees, the inflow infiltration fees. You know, one of the things that drives any d discussion on capacity is inflow and infiltration. And, in a nutshell, that's rainwater, groundwater, anything other than sewage that may get into a sewer system and impact the flow. Uh, if you have a wet year, your I and I component goes up, your flows go up. It doesn't necessarily mean that people are flushing their toilets more. It just means that you're getting extraneous flow in the system. When you have a dry year, the I and I goes down. If you were to look historically at the the flow records for Narragansett over the last 15 or 20 years, you you will see that it. It's a pattern that follows the weather. And if the town um, limits the capacity of sewer connections at 85%, does that effectively mean that 
anyone will ever, ever be able to hook up with sewers again? If that is held as a hard and true number, yes. Nothing further. Thank you. All right. Thank you both. Um, I want to call up because our town engineer, for a couple of reasons. First of all, I probably should have called him up first it, <clears throat> before the applicant. But secondly, just for my own edification, and he can walk us through, and if he repeats for anybody, feel free to chime in. But the sewer policy process, and just summarize how we got here. I know Jeff did some of that, but it was not in the same narrative format. So, and you can um, walk us through that. Thank I apologize. Thank you. No problem. Um, uh, my name is uh, Jonathan Gerhard, G-E-R-H-A-R-D, and I'm the town engineer. Um, yes, the, the sewer policy, uh, as uh, Mr. Cesarine, uh stated, there were two um, hearings. Uh, initially before that, there was an application for um, sewer availability where the, an applicant comes in and fills out a form in the uh, engineering office, uh, and our staff reviews it to, to make an assessment uh, based on criteria, whether sewers are available in their location uh, and or whether um, they would need a waiver of the sewer policy to be able to obtain uh, sewer service. Um, this particular lot is in a sewered area where, the, and that was the, uh, the recommendation, was the sewers are available, but they would need a waiver of the sewer policy to uh, allow for the 20 additional units that there were proposed on the lot uh, because the, the current sewer policy is one lot, one unit. Uh, right now there are the 32 or 36, 36 units uh, at the property that are currently licensed, so they already have, uh, those are permitted uh, units on the lot, so they, were, they just need a waiver to get 20 additional units on this lot uh, based on the density. And then they, what they did was uh, they made that application, and I believe we uh, made the recommendation they requested with the understanding they were going to need to go to sewer policy. We went and made, uh, came to the council, made the uh, requested uh, that the matter be referred to the sewer policy committee, and then it was heard on two occasions. Thank you. Are there any questions from the council for um, the town engineer? Yeah, I have a question. Um, did the applicant receive the September 12th um, sewer policy committee interpretation of, uh, I guess, the average of the last three years? Did they receive this document? Uh, no, they did not. And they okay, is there not. any way we get a copy of this document to them? Um, yes, that's public record now, and that could be provided yeah, to them. I appreciate that. that. Was, uh, that's this, a similar memo to what is prepared for the sewer committee members. That's the first time I saw it, and I'm on the committee. So This one was prepared uh, just prior to this meeting. Right. Uh, it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise well, me. It's the, uh, the information was, was most recently presented. Uh, okay. Most recently received from, from the... Um, the now, town of South Kingstown. Uh, the, the issue with that is, uh, and it required an amendment based on the current sewer policy condition, whereas understood. if, a, if a, an application came in today, there is no capacity based on the 85% threshold. Understood. understood. So the September 12th memo that we have um, is an update to your original recommendation, and, and, um, <clears throat> and it was a, these, all these documents were attached to the agenda mm -hmm. for, for us. <clears throat> Thank God it made it here in time. Um, I'm not a sewer guy. When stormwater gets into the sewer line, what's that called? There's a term for it. It's infiltration. Infiltration. Okay. Now, the last time we had major infiltration was uh, during 2010, if I believe. Is that correct? When we had that spring There's rain and... It's a continuous, uh, continuous Issue. activity. It's happening all the time. It's just the, as, as Mr. Cesarine indicated, as well. It is heavily influenced by the amount of rainfall we have. Is there a formula for a percentage of the sewer capacity that is infiltration? 
there's no formula to determine how much of it is. Uh, the state has guidelines for how much is allowable that you're allowed to utilize for planning based on uh, current construction methods and <laughs> pipeline tightness that you're allowed to account for a certain amount of infiltration no matter what when you size a new facility or size a new pump station. So there is some type of computation you could apply to bring the capacity level down? The, the way- Theoretically? Well, our, our capacity is based on, our, our limitation is based on our allotted capacity, which we own and, right. and rent. Correct, but uh, if we have infiltration, like in one year if we have 20% infiltration and then the next year we have 45% infiltration, that affects capacity, correct? Well, it, yeah, it, it uh, affects the, uh, the volume of flow that's presented to the facility. And what we do, if you have a problem with infiltration, there are studies and investigations, and there have been done, some done in the past in Narragansett, and that's what the INI fee uh, in the sewer policy addresses as well. We charge an additional fee to put that money aside to implement uh, infiltration inflow right. uh, projects as well. When was the plant bill? 73, I think, 73? Somewhere in that vicinity, I believe, yes. <clears throat> Since infiltration is caused by weather, as stated earlier by uh, the esteemed Mr. Cesarine, should we have a formula based on the average rainfall, on rainfall based from 73 to today, and keep some type of average formula that you can plug in to capacity? Because if it rains, you know, two weeks before somebody wants to get sewers, then we're over capacity for Christ's sakes, theoretically. Well, yeah, I agree. There, there like could today. Be, there could be a way to account for that within the, uh, within the sewer policy, but that's not in the current sewer policy. So that's something right. that could be investigated. All right. What's the current total capacity of usage of that sewer plant today? Like 54%, 55? Uh, let me I have some numbers here. I can double check that. As of our, I'll use the, uh, the latest three-year average, which is, was 2.71 million gallons out of 5 million gallons a day, and that is 54.2% of the total 54 capacity. 54.2%. So we're at point, I mean, we're not, <laughs> and, and 2009 was a, was a above average rain, correct? 2009, yes, 2019 I mean, I'm also. sorry, uh, <laughs> 2019. Yes. This uh, year yes. was, this year's was would put us to, uh, or this past year was is the the plant was at 3.03 million gallons a day and at 60 percent of 60.6 uh, percent. Right. So so if if it was an average rainfall, then we would be under that 85 percent. If if the uh, it plugged yeah, in, if the infiltration, if the if the flow last year was lower, we would be within it. Um, or if we used a, you know, a longer duration of five years or we had a formula to, right. to account for I&I and, I and make an assessment as to what percentage of that right. was the flow, that could be incorporated too. Because like Jeff said, you know, we got, what, 28% of affordable housing and everybody's squawking about affordable housing and here's a project that's providing affordable housing. And so they come up with some semantics all right, well, I think I made my point. Thank you. Thank you, anyone else? Mr. Lima. So I guess one of the questions I have, I, I don't think we'll ever see any expansion to our sewer system, will we, as far as the plants go? Well, that's what the sewer policy uh, accounts for, the expansions, uh, and that's what the waivers have been granted, all those waivers that were referenced. So what I mean, we're not going to enlarge the sewer plant. Oh, uh, we would not enlarge the sewer plant on our own because it would be, uh, it would be cost prohibitive for us right. to do that uh, because you need to do that in certain magnitudes, and we are the only partner that has any need for additional capacity. Right. And to offset the cost, we would be requesting our other partners to be able to, to make the next step of a, you know, you would need to do a certain percentage-wise. You can't just do, 
you know, the, you know, the few hundred thousand gallons a day we need to make this work. You go in, in large bulk increments and, and pre create another quarter the size of the plant. I think that may be the next step. I'm not sure what the full, the next expansion would be of the treatment plant, but it would probably be on the order of, of a million and a half to two million gallons a day. So my concerns would be people who, and I don't know how many there are, but people that who maybe want to hook up to these sewers that already have existing property or have existing house lots that have been waiting, is there a number on that? Um, I, don't, I don't know what the number is specifically, but anyone who is within the sewer area that has, uh, has approved frontage would not even have to come to the sewer policy committee. Right, and do we, uh, again, if they chose to, if, if 30 house lots wanted to hook in, we're fine with that. They would, they would be able to hook in if they had existing frontage and, okay. and we're doing one per lot. Right. If they, if they want to, you know, multi-unit uh, uh, development within a lot or high density, they would need to come for sewer policy relief. Right. There's a neighborhood down by Breakwater Village, and I think that they're pumping into a tank and then they're getting pumped out. That's a different sewer plant. Yeah, that's break, a totally break water, different one. Breakwater would, would uh, be tributary to uh, the town. So they go to Sand Hill plant. Cove. That wouldn't affect this one at yeah, all. They, and we got plenty of room down in Scarborough to account for them okay. if they want to uh, all right. pursue that. As long as people can hook in. I mean, I want people that have already been waiting, mm -hmm. whether they're in town or what, being able to hook up if they choose to. I th uh, thank you. Mr. Pugh or Ms. Lawler? <clears throat> sure. Here we go. Um, thanks, John, for coming up. Uh, a few questions for you. So I'm looking at these memos because I'm not on the sewer policy committee, so I wasn't, you know, CC'd on the memo. Um, so I didn't see any of this until we get the, until we got the agenda. Um, there's a memo from August 1st, which is to <coughs> Ms. Lawler and to Mr. Murray from you um, that actually your recommendation is uh, to approve the request in this memo on August 1st, um, and it has the capacity at 79.6% currently. So you're approving it uh, or recommending its approval in that one. And then we have the September 12th memo, which was specifically to President Mannix, um, which has new data, and then you are not, you're not recommend, recommending approval. Um, when did the data come in that you uh, have in this latest one? That data came in at, uh, at the very end of July, uh, beginning of August. Um, it, had, it was not reviewed prior to the, the second memo or the, the August 1st memo. The August 1st memo was essentially uh, the same memo that was provided for the June meeting um, with uh, just to change the dates and, and account for the fact that we had met and uh, that the sewer policy committee had uh, sought the counsel from uh, the assistant town, assistant town solicitor prior to uh, reviewing the, uh, the application. So that's, that was the difference of the dates. And, and the, the, we get the data on an annual basis. It's, it goes on a fiscal year basis, and it goes from um, July through June, or July through, um, let me just look here, excuse me. Yes, it's July through June, but we did. They, they, it lags about a month till they get us the data, and then we have we have a billing back to to uh, South Kingstown. So that that data uh, was possibly in house, but had not been reviewed at the time of okay. the August first memo. Okay. Um, so that was just data that you were able to get to in between August and September, or, or was it data that? Um, well, it's just we, a little bit strange that it just was sent to Matt. Is that were you directed to calculate the new data? I, I was prepared to to make that to present that information to the council here tonight, um, and the reason that was directed to Matt was because the sewer policy committee did not um, did voted to send it to the council without a recommendation, and that's where the 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 next hearing was being held. So it was directed to the council president. Okay, got it. Thanks. Was that information requested? Uh, I was asked to provide a memorandum to, to update the, uh, the, the information. Who, who asked, who asked you to manager. update the, inf the I data? I discussed with the town manager and, and uh, <clears throat> with, the, with um, I don't recall who was in with the meeting besides the town manager, the council president, and I, uh, as we went on. 
Good thing we don't get a new library, because we're going to need uh, two over there, Terry too. Terry was there when we were reviewing the council agenda. We were reviewing the council agenda, and I had asked John if he could, if it's possible to update that information. And he said he wasn't sure if he was able to, but he was going to work on it. And he did. Um, so, John, I'm just for the way that this is calculated, um, when we do the average per year, that is the full year, right? So that calculates January to December. It doesn't choose months or um, high months or low months, right? No, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't discount any months. And again, it goes from, it goes from uh, July to June on a fiscal year basis. And that's why, that's why the numbers changed. We got the new fiscal year from South Kingstown. South Kingstown runs the plant and provides the flow data to us. And then we just work off of it. And rather than you know, changing it from, from month to month to month, it's been uh, the, the, the sewer policy uh, has worked off of an annual, the annual flow for, on each year. Okay, and have you, so I think it states in here that the only time it was this, as high as it was this last year, was 2010, right? 2010? That's the last time it was anywhere near what it is to. This so, year. in the years between the last eight or nine years, has, it, has there been a slow and steady increase up? I believe there was an uptick um, the, last, uh, the last two or three years, but it has, it's, been, it's been as low as 1.02, I believe, and as high as, I think last year may have been 1.15 or 117. I can I can check that number from. I may not have I may not have the individual numbers here. I may just have the whole annual average. So it's not. But in your opinion, um, we're not really seeing a trend up. It's kind of just a little bit sporadic, right? No, the last year jumped by twenty percent across the board from last what it, from what it had been the prior. Correct. This last year, yes, right? The two thousand nineteen eighteen nineteen flow was a was a twenty percent increase over the prior three year period. It was, okay. So it's more of like an anomaly than, than it's, a trend. It's, uh, and it's a large increase and was not reflected anywhere prior to 2009 and 10. Mm -hmm. um, and since we're only doing three years, it's like re a relatively small sample size to come up with this average? Uh, generally, I think uh, it's, it's a lot of uh, regulatory requirements are over, over a year period or if you have three consecutive months where you have excessive flows and, and you're reaching your plant capacity, then you need to investigate expansion. But as we said, this plant is not, the plant's not under these conditions. It's the town and we don't have, we aren't under the same boundaries to go and, and seek that expansion. Okay. So we're at 80, this, the, this latest data puts us at 85.9% of capacity, mm -hmm. right? Um, the last number was 79.6, so this one year does make a big impact in changing exactly. those numbers. If we were at 84.9%, we would be under capacity. We'd be under, under the 85 for the next count, for the mm -hmm. next fiscal year until the next flows come in. So what so happens out. now at our regional wastewater uh, facility, now that we're at 85.9%, what changes? Uh, nothing really. We pay for we pay uh, for operational costs based on the amount of flow we put there. So our percentage of the costs is is based on that number, mm -hmm. and that number fluctuates to 40, 45 percent. All our other all the other partners were up uh, over the same period last year as well. So mm -hmm. our percentage didn't really fluctuate all that much uh, from what it had been. But and there's terms, and there's no additional cost for staffing. For that. No, it's, it's, it doesn't. It doesn't influence the staffing. I don't. I think you'd be talking about plant expansion and the like before those those uh, costs came into play. Mm -hmm. um, so, are there? How much of an impact does um, something widespread adoption of um, more efficient uh, f facilities um, within the home impact uh, this usage? Like. Water, saving toilets, showers, those sort of things. Uh, that would have an impact. Needless to say, any, any water conservation device would reduce the flow to the sewer system. And mm -hmm. I believe that is what, uh, what part of that implementation throughout the town historically is what allowed us to reduce our, our commitment uh, that we rent from, from URI from 400,000 gallons a day down to 200. So the combined with, with some I&I &I reduction as well. And in, the, in a complex or a a, develop, a, a development with a couple condo buildings, apartment buildings, they can install those sort of uh, toilets throughout. Um, uh, the, the new construction, uh, the new building would have to comply with the current codes and if they're gonna redo all of the interior, uh, if, if those, I don't know what the plumbing is and the fixtures are in the existing facility, those would need to be upgraded to uh, current uh, efficient and low flow devices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, even if, you know, the question was brought up about how we increase capacity, um, 
on the one end, but of course it could be conserved, conserved on the other end, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, all right. That's all I have for questions for you. Thank you. I got one more question, possibly too. Patrick, can, be, can I add something sure. before you? Just a point of clarification: the memo that we're referring to right now, dated September 12th, um, to Matt, was actually included in our town council packet, which was September 12th emailed out to us. Terry emailed it out to the afternoon. So, although it was addressed to Matt on the 12th, we every single one of us had had the ability to take a look at it because it was included in our packet. Well, I didn't know they were going to cook the books. <laughs> So the, um, what happened, we, we, had the met, we had an original memo, and then the um, town engineer, there's additional data from the wet season that he wanted to, he provided, um, provided that, that increase because the, we have a sewer policy regarding, we went from 80 to 85 percent, so it's, it's relevant information. It's a vote to waive the sewer policy, so we can waive the sewer policy, right? That, it, whether, exactly. whether it's a wet it was, season or a dry season, but it is information that he, that had come about, and that's and why it, he has the second to memo. To present that that portion right. of the sewer policy would require a waiver for this application as well. And, and to provide uh, the I just have one question. Um, so we, in, well, I guess three years, what it was, seven, nine point nine, and 16, right, capacity? Uh, the, the prior three-year average was 79.6, I believe. Where is it? 85. So we basically went up. Yeah, so we basically went up a little over um, six percent in three years. Does that seem excessive? Uh, we went up over six percent in one year. One year. Okay. Well, six percent so, in a three-year average due right. to shifting. From so the one year last year, 18, year 19, year. one year, say five plus percent. Uh, you think that's due to inf infiltration? It would be a be appear that it is due to the high flow last year. Okay. When there, was, there was excessive rain in the, uh, in right. the late fall and, and uh, winter. Okay. So stormwater in the sewer system is not, you know, feces or really actual sewer. It's stormwater. No, it's, yeah, it, it just increases the hydraulic load on the treatment right. plant. Right, right, right. Um, okay, I just, all right. Thank you. It's just one more comment. Um, so, you know, the reason why I would support this waiver would be because of the character of the, of the project, not just because someone wants to build an additional 30 condos. It's because of the affordable housing, of course. Um, that's something that you know we've all talked about up here. I know Rick talked about that a few months ago as well. And this is a chance for us to actually do it and to get above that 25% affordable housing within a specific project that we never get above here in town um, and to do it at a larger scale. So we're not talking about six, a six unit building where you're putting in two units. This is gonna be 16 units. Um, it's gonna replace a building that has 20 units with a building that will have 16 affordable units, and then you're gonna have the whole new um, building as well. I don't love the idea of having more condos in town. I don't think anybody loves that. But when you have a chance to take advantage of, uh, of the project and get that, that affordable and mid-level uh, housing at this scale, I think you have to do it. Um, when you look at the overhead map here of that area, it shows the lot just north of this lot, and this is an older map, and it shows that as being uh, undeveloped. It's that lot that had all the reeds that's right across from the ocean wall. Uh, and now, <laughs> it's, yeah. it is developed with two large homes that are not, you know, they fit in well into that area because that's all there is in that area. Mm -hmm. So this is a chance to have middle class people living in Narragansett and that's exactly why we have the waiver. So I'm in support of that. So it's, sorry, not a question for you. I know you're up there still, but thanks. Thank you. Anyone else from the council? All right, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks John. Um, thanks. Is there anyone else who would like to comment? I'm sorry, Mr. President. Um, yes. Can I just ask Mr. Cesarin just to come for one clarification point? Sure. We have uh, another expert uh, regarding the hardship aspect of the proposal. Uh, Mr. Cesarin, can you tell the council uh, whether the uh, agreement between the three entities 
has a limitation on the capacity for Narragansett? It does not. The intermunicipal agreements between URI, South Kingstown, and Narragansett are silent other than stipulating a percentage of, of flow that each partner owns. Um, it does not impose the 85% level or anything like that. That's strictly a self-imposed one. Uh, we could use 100% of our capacity every day of the year and we would not be in violation of the intermunicipal agreement. The, the underlying uh, concern would be when the plant itself reaches a 70 or 80 percent threshold, then there'd be a regulatory requirement to do an expansion project. But at 54 percent, that's a long way off. And as uh, Mr. Gerhardt had testified, we are the only, Narragansett is the only partner that is even close to its capacity. That's, that's why I think a project like this can be assimilated. And uh, Mr. Lima brought up a good point uh, regarding vacant lots or houses that maybe have septic and are seeking to tie into the sewer system. If we're at 85 percent, doesn't that effectively require every applicant who wants sewer to seek a waiver? Yes, in my opinion it would. If, if you were going to hold the 85 percent as the strict threshold um, with any action this evening, then it would be my opinion that everybody coming forward starting tomorrow morning would need to go before the sewer policy committee for a waiver. Because that every connection would increase the capacity and thereby raise the number above 85 percent. Correct. And that's, you know, that is the, I don't want to say it's an issue because I was a proponent of the 85 percent number being in the policy last year. And I know Patrick, Jill, we spent quite a bit of time talking about it. Um, it's good to have a number in there but it's a moving target. As John said, it will change with the weather every year. You know, we we're typically in the 79% range. We saw an anomaly this year. I, you know, if I could forecast the weather, I'd probably be making a lot of money and not be on TV or something, but uh, I don't know where that flow will be a year from now. I don't know if any of us can say that, but I think it's, it's reasonable when you look at the history too to expect that there will be fluctuations based on weather. And does that necessarily drive the treatment plant in or out of compliance? It does not. The, the plant has been in compliance since the day it was constructed. And still, the total is under 55 percent. The co total capacity right now is under 55 percent capacity. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. We'd like to ask uh, Russell Shatniff to uh, come to this microphone. And again, for the purpose of the record, um, I'd like to use Mr. Cesarin's qualification as an offer of proof that he would be qualified as an expert. I understand your position at this point. I'd like to do the same for Mr. Shatniff. Mr. Shatniff, you're an engineer? Yes. Oh, actually, say, state your name. I apologize. Uh, my name is Russell J. Shatniff. Spelled C as in Charles, H-A-T-E-A-U-N-E-U-F. Mr. Shatniff, you're an engineer? I am. And you're registered with the state of Rhode Island? I am. And you currently work as a senior project manager for Horsley Witten. Yes. And that's an engineering company in Providence and other Correct. regional offices. And prior to Horsley Witten, you were an engineer for the state of Rhode Island? I was. And you worked for the Department of Envi Environmental Management for how many years? About 22 years. And in your role there, you were the chief of office water resources? Actually, the chief of groundwater and wetlands protection. Okay. And yeah. uh, in that role, you were responsible for managing the state's groundwater and wetlands protection programs. Correct. Also, you were managed the licensee of, uh, licensing of on-site wastewater treatment installers? Yes. And on-site wastewater treatment design? Correct. Um, you also managed the surface water quality certification program? I did. And now you're a senior project manager for a private company, Horsley Witten? Correct. And um, in that role, you help assess a project for septic or OWTS systems? From time to time, yes. And uh, from time to time, yes. And again, I'd ask that Mr. Shatniff be recognized an expert in engineering and use as an offer of proof for that purpose uh, for this hearing. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I'd ask Mr. Shatniff. Again, it's not a hearing, James. I mean, it's not technically a hearing. That's the problem. But right. for the record, right. when we go further than this, if that does occur, I need to show that Mr. Shatniff I know, I know. and Mr. Cesar are know. experts. Right. And that is the, the role or the, the way to do that. Um, Thank you. Well, I'm pleased to be here. I will be brief. I promise to be brief. Uh, I was wondering if we could have on the overhead a, a map of this site uh, as proposed. Is that possible? Do we have that? I'm working on it. Yeah. 
Um, Ooh, nice. The one that was just there would be the one that I want to use. Uh, that's a little bit busy, but I could use that. <laughs> uh, that'll be fine. Um, I'm pleased to be here. Um, I frequently am, or in the past, have addressed councils with my DEM hat on. Uh, I'm going to try not to speak like that tonight. Uh, if somehow you get the impression that I'm speaking for DEM, I have no such intent. Uh, I am in the private sector now, uh, although I do know a lot about DEM's rules, in particular the septic, the septic system rules, uh, which I had a big part in writing. Um, I guess the first thing uh, that I'd like to say is that the, the DEM uh, has a rule concerning sewer tie-ins. Um, and it's actually it's part of Rule 6.15e, and I'm just going to read part of it to you because I think it's essential to understand that the YOUTS program, they look at this first, okay, when there's a sewer in the street. As a connection to the public wastewater system, an OUTS application shall not be approved if such OUTS is proposed to serve a premises for which public wastewater system is reasonably accessible, as determined by the director, and for which the permission to enter the public sewer system can be obtained from the authority having jurisdiction. Um, one of the key things about this is that um, we want to be consistent. DEM wants to be consistent with municipalities. They don't want to undermine their process of sewering by allowing people to put septic systems when they have sewer access. Um, because municipal sewer service and expansion plans, they're the preview of local government and often consider environmental factors uh, and future service needs and generally anticipate private property connections as part of their overall technical and financial planning. Uh, so the state understands that and so up front in its rules on septic system it has that there. So this request for approval um, uh, before, before you uh, is certainly consistent with that rule. Uh, now, um, I understand from, from, my, from looking at the records on this uh, project that there was a prior use uh, on the property, uh, and it's roughly located on the east side of the lot uh, between the proposed large West. building and Ocean Road. West. And apparently that building um, became defunct or burned down at some, at some point in the past. What we do know is it had, did have a sewer connection. There are actually two uh, lines, one going to Congdon Street and one going to Ocean Road, so that it actually did have a connection at one time. Uh, but we have a new project here. Uh, there is an, on the lot, there's an existing uh, multifamily dwelling that is connected to the sewer. So it would be logical that the DEM staff would look at this and say, well, you know, let's, you should probably be going to sewer and get an understanding why they couldn't do that, okay? And there's, that's your, obviously your purview. Now, in, for the design of a septic system, there are five primary concerns. The amount of wastewater to be discharged, the depth to the seasonal high groundwater table, it's gotta be a minimum of two feet from the original ground surface, the properties of the soil beneath the site, the required size of the drain field that would be necessary, um, and also attaining proper setbacks from sensitive resources, from property lines, uh, public drinking water wells, and so forth. Uh, so the amount of wastewater to be discharged by this project, based on the 22 bedrooms that we heard, is 6,440 um, gallons a day, okay? You need a fairly large system for that, um, and I'll get into that in a minute. So we did some, for other reasons, we did test pit work out here, uh, mostly for the stormwater system. Uh, and we excavated three test pits. Uh, one was the lower um, east side of that uh, site. Uh, another about midway along the line, along the southerly line, um, about midway, there's another lot, it's called test pit three. And then on Congdon Street, or off of Congdon Street, between Congress Street and the new structure, we did test pit two. And there was basically three test pits there. And what we found, we found a lot of 
what we call fill and call, we call it human transported material because it isn't something we encountered these things and said, obviously this wasn't there originally. Um, uh, and we found quite a bit of it, anywhere from two to six feet uh, on this property. The other thing we found that was it has a high water table. Uh, test pit one near the front uh, was two feet below the ground surface. Um, and the original ground surface is like maybe six inches above that water table. Um, we also found similar conditions to test pit two. Those areas would not be considered suitable for an on-site system, okay? Um, so the net result of the limited testing that we did on the property um, was a finding that there was substantial fill as much as two to six feet and had been placed on the property at some time in the past. Uh, and then we had two that, test pits that actually didn't have, show suitable conditions. Now just for a moment, this hazardous, this human transported material really can be anything. Typically it's fill, uh, soil brought from another site um, are used to make a land level, maybe build it up uh, so that you can have a foundation there. Um, in the past, before the wetland rules came into effect, fill was human transport material was used to fill wetlands to try to make it suitable for building. And that was done throughout the country and not just in Rhode Island. Uh, but since those rules have been put into effect, uh, that is not the case. Uh, we also found materials that we believe were part of the old building uh, that may have been demolished on that site. Now, this human transport material is really unsuitable for disposal of wastewater because we don't uh, understand what it is. And it's not uniform like soil. So we can't trust what kind of treatment it would provide. So the department's rules are that you have to remove that material. Okay. Um, and you also have to have a water table from original grade of at least two feet. Um, that doesn't exist for the most part on the east side of that lot, okay? Um, sometimes you can fill, uh, fill, you can remove the, the HTM and you can fill it with gravel, but you'd have to have a water table that's pretty low and be below that and get that minimum two and a half uh, feet, uh, feet of, to the seasonal high groundwater table. We also looked at the size of the system that would be needed. Uh, as you may know, there's a lot of advanced technology around where you can actually put a septic system on a lot on a pretty small footprint, okay? So I looked at the best technology available and it would be around, the leach field would be, a, we'll call it a drain field, would be at grade, but it would still be uh, two to 3,000 square feet in size. Uh, and it could possibly go near test pit three. But the problem is, with that size, it wouldn't work with this plan. It couldn't possibly go there and fit everything in there and get you required setbacks, okay? Again, this is on the basis of one test hole, which had six feet of fill. But at least below that, the water table was deeper. So you could put something there, but nothing that could, could accept 6,440 gallons a day, okay? Um, so these findings lead us to conclude that the site is not suitable for an ouch of the required size to dispose of wastewater on site for the project as previously designed and approved. Um, I could talk a lot more about um, the conditions on the property and so forth, but I'll um, ask you to ask questions. Maybe I can explore those other areas if you wish. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Is, um, I'm going to see if there's anyone else who wants to speak to the matter. All right. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Karen Chab Shalowitz, S H A B S H E L O W I T Z. Having lived on Wanda Street for 32 years, I've seen a lot of pipe breaks at the corner of Wanda and Strathmore. 
And there have definitely been, that whole new Knotchett development was not there when we moved in, and there have been additional houses put on Wanda Street. And when they had the pipe breaks, I would go out and say, well, why are all these pipe breaks happening in this area? They said, because the pipes are old, and, and we're getting a lot more usage of the pipes. So my concern is, and especially after we had the problem with Suez water last year around Labor Day and E. coli mixing in and they couldn't find the source and I get my water directly from Suez and as a retired nurse, I'm really nervous about the quality of water. And what I heard from Suez is they would add more chlorine to counteract the E. coli. And I'm just really concerned about the impact of additional concentrated housing and more sewers in especially being that close to the ocean. And if we ha we've been lucky. We haven't had any big hurricanes since Bob as far as a lot of damage in Narragansett. That was 91. But I'm really concerned about um, the quality of drinking water and whether there's gonna be any cross-contamination. And um, we're always talking about how there's too many condominiums and too many housing. And even though I'm all for affordable housing, I've seen where that's gone in the 32 years, and it hasn't been in a very good direction. But I'm really concerned, like, shouldn't we be taking care of the pipes that we have and replacing the pipes before we start adding more um, sewerage to the system that's already taxed. And at the bottom of Wanda Street is that pumping station. And it usually smells awful when you walk by there. And so, and there have been so many more houses that have been put on the sewer system. So I'm like, I don't wanna rush into any more housing in Narragansett with the current pipes that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? All right, so I'm um, just gonna come back to the council for discussion on it. This is a unique situation. If everyone noticed the speakers, um, I, I mentioned to Mr. Callahan that it was not technically a public hearing, but I also know that he took the time and expense to get a stenographer, so he has certain things that he wanted to get on the record. So I did not restrict the speakers um, for that reason, and I know I just wanted to put that out there. You also see, this is a situation where our sewer policy committee was split. So usually you'll see a recommendation one way or the other on the agenda when we have a sewer policy situation. You'll notice this says a motion to provide a decision. So again, a unique situation. I've never served on the sewer policy committee, so I don't know all the nuances of those procedures. Um, but I just wanted to say that's kind of why you, this is a little different from what everybody has seen before because it is it is a one-of-a-kind situation. So uh, in, terms of, in terms of what we heard about in terms of the testimony and the different three-year rolling averages on the, um, on the average flow, there's, there's a series of three-year averages over, over the years. And so if you have a wet year, then you're gonna have a situation in which you're gonna have the, we're hitting closer to the capacity. But the co council's job is to think about all those issues, you know, that what's the rolling average, you know, what is the three-year average, and then over a different time, what, what is your policy decision regarding making a waiver or not to the policy? So that's ultimately why these items come up to us, is we have to make a decision, and generally we have a recommendation, and in this case, um, we have a split decision from the sewer policy. So I just wanted to summarize that for everybody. Um, go ahead. Thanks again, Mr. Mannix. Um, Mr. DeLuca, you mind uh, just providing the uh, first slide where the shows the hotel previous on site? I think it's kind of an interesting aspect of this, which I didn't know about prior to this uh, project. This is the Carlton Hotel. That was pre previously on site. I think it was uh, destroyed at some point in the mid-1900s, but uh, I think it shows where the fill may have come from in this project. Um, and also, Mr. DeLuca, can you go to the uh, proposed um, development as uh, in the preliminary, preliminary plan um, as submitted. <laughs> thank you. The, uh, yeah, the overhead, thank you. 
believe it's, I believe it's nine, actually the, the rendering, number 19? 19. Thank you. And that's basically what it's uh, proposed to look like, keeps the open space. And I just wanna go over a few things I gave to you as exhibits, I'm not to belabor this sewer issue, I know it's not the most fascinating thing, but we have to go through the process, I'm sorry. Uh, again, thank you for your time. Um, as uh, Mr. Cesarin and Mr. Gerhardt indicated, uh, this waiver policy has been utilized by residents and landowners for years at almost a 100% approval rate. Um, we're asking for approval here because the parameters of this uh, proposal meet the policy waiver requirements. Uh, first and foremost, it meets the required uh, low-income affordable housing on a beautiful plot of land. I venture to say that this will be one of the nicest uh, Type of that, that type of units in this town, the state, if not the country. And I can guarantee that after this hearing today, you'll be getting calls at town hall tomorrow to the clerk's office asking how to get one of these uh, units, because they call my office after we have every hearing as well. Um, and right now in the exhibits I gave you, on the commerce plan, I submitted pages 80 through 101, the housing aspect. It specifically referenced this project as adding 16 units to get the town to 5.3 percent affordable and without this or this kind of project this town will never get there um, additionally i submitted the narragansett affordable housing plan uh, from 2005 on page 48 which is part of the exhibits this site specifically was identified as a location for 56 units 16 of which could be affordable and that's exactly what the developers have proposed. Um, and again, in your ordinance regarding multifamily dwellings, section 17.2, in high water table districts, which is exhibit four in your package, uh, the soils map, this is a district B uh, soil map, and the high water table here indicates that multifamily dwellings should be connected to sewer, water, and public utilities. So I think your ordinance indicates that now, aside from the sewer policy, that this kind of project should be approved and part of the sewer system. Um, and for reference, this project started in 2010. It's been a long, long process. It was uh, first denied by the planning board due to an integration issue, which is not before you, appealed to SHAB, which is the State Housing Board of Appeals. That decision was overturned. Then it went to Superior Court, where it was upheld, and then Supreme Court, where it was again upheld. So that's the preliminary, or sorry, master plan approvals, which are this project right here. Um, I just think that based on the travel of this project and the benefit the town will get, including the tax benefits we haven't mentioned yet, the project itself should be approved based on the requirements and the sewer waiver. Um, the median house price in Narragansett is $160,000 more than the statewide average. Um, I think it goes without saying, again, if this project is not approved, it gets a sewer line, it can't be done, as Mr. Shatton have testified, there is a hardship here. I think that was one of the issues at the sewer policy. So for all those reasons, I ask uh, that you consider approving this waiver request and also consider the fact that if this request is denied and we're at the 85%, any housing project or house that comes before you or gets built in the next five years or whatever it is, is gonna to have to come before you for the, the same similar uh, relief. And to deny them and this project um, seems uh, inconsistent with the town's goals. So thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, from the council then, we're, I'm gonna need a motion on a decision, which way or the other, and then we can discuss that. Is there a motion from anyone? A motion to approve this waiver. Is there a second? Second. All right, any discussion on that? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? No. no. No, all right, motion fails two to three. Item number nine is a motion to award the bid for Kingfisher Fire Radio Boxes and Receiving Equipment to the sole bidder, Kingfisher Company Incorporated, in a total amount of $57,350 and at that master box pricing of $2,500 per unit for a five-year period. So moved. Second. Discussion. Anyone from the council? Public. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion approved five to zero. 
Item number 10 is a motion to approve the electrical services required for the installation of the Kingfisher radio boxes and receiving equipment to be completed by EW Audit and Sons, incorporating the amount of $21,450. So moved. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion approved 5 to 0. Item number 11, a motion to rescind the bid award for T-shirts and golf shirts for the Parks and Recreation Department from SP Designs and Manufacturing and award the bid to the second lowest bidder, DRN's Corporation, at their quarter prices for a one-year period ending September 2nd, 2020. So moved. Second. Discussion. Right, so this item was for those um, the different T-shirts for Parks and Rec, and there were additional costs that were being thrown in by the original bidder afterwards. Any other comments? All, right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion approved 5 to 0. Item 12 is a motion to approve the lease agreement with Sprint Spectrum LP for communications equipment at the Point Judith water tank site. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, motion approved 5 to 0. And item 14 is a motion to schedule a work session to provide a response to Rhode Island Department of Transportation's readiness review regarding the preferred alternative alignment for design and construction of William C. O'Neill bike path extension. So moved. Second. Discussion. Um, the date that we're looking at for this is going to be um, October 21st at 7 p.m. Is that what? 21st. Um, so originally, in the I think in the blue sheet, it was suggested for the 7th, but some of the people who are um, very involved with the project have asked if we could put that on a different date. They won't be available. And so um, I think and to accommodate that would be um, good. So any, um, is everyone available at that time? At what time, though? This is October 21st at 7 p.m. 7 p.m.? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so the motion to schedule this for October 21st at 7 p.m. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion approved 5 to 0. Open forum, the public comment section of our meeting. Please, this is an um, area where people can comment on issues affecting the town. Please conduct yourself in an orderly and respectful fashion. These comments are neither adopted nor endorsed, endorsed by the body, but are heard as requested. Does anyone want to speak in public comment? Yes. Carlene Town, 240 Wood Hill Road. I was really hoping there would be a motion on tonight's agenda dealing with the withdrawal of Mr. Muda's offer to buy the Belmont building because he realized that the majority of townspeople would not support his venture because it was depriving us of our future library's home. I was also hoping that Matt, Jill, and Rick had realized that all the questions and statements from Jesse, Patrick, and the concerned citizens who spoke at the last town council meeting had finally sunk in, and they had realized that their deal with Mr. Muda was, in fact, a bad deal for the town. No such luck. Matt talked about all his own conceived flaws in the town's purchase of the Belmont building. Certainly, he can understand that the deal with Mr. Muda has even more glaring flaws. For instance, no business plan, no proof of funds, Mr. Muda's ability to sell it outright if he pays the lien, and most glaring of all, the fact that the town will be entering the mortgage business on the taxpayer's dime. Not to beat a dead horse, but I would like to revisit that last town council meeting. And once again, I would like to encourage everyone to watch the town council meetings on tape, even those of you who are here in the audience, as you will witness so many inconsistencies in the statements of Matt and Jill. At the 40 minute mark, Matt described Mr. Moda's concept as, and I quote, a kitchen in the middle with eateries around it and seating around it, almost like a food court. Around the 46 minute mark, Jill said she had met with Mr. Muda, Mark, and Rick, and said that Mr. Muda described his concept for Narragansett as similar to his current Connecticut project, which he calls a food court, or a European market. Less than one minute later, 
Jill criticized the audience for its food court signs and said, it is not a food court. Just one more inconsistency. Matt talked about one kitchen. Jill stated that it could be up to 20 professional kitchens on Mr. Muda's dime. Listening to these different descriptions of the proposed plans leads one to believe that either one, Mr. Mooter told you all different descriptions of what he wanted to do. Two, you didn't understand what Mr. Mooter was proposing. Or three, you were just rushing the town into a bad deal just to prove that the majority of the town council has the power to overturn the will of the people. Isn't that a dictatorship? One final note. Although Jill did not lie and state that Mr. Muda was a resident, she did try to mislead the audience by stating that Mr. Muda has lived here for 12 to 13 years. Let it be known by all that Mr. Muda receives his Narragansett tax bill at 96 Barrington Way in Glastonbury, Connecticut. I'm assuming that's his residence, not Narragansett. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Susan Amoruso, uh, West Bay Drive. Um, I'm also concerned about the library because uh, last meeting we had um, glowing reports about the police department being you know, accredited, everybody was so happy, but we have no plan on how to fix our library problem, and it is a problem. And our town is so underserved by the size of our library. I mean, this has been going on for years and years. This isn't a quick decision. Um, I started thinking about Block Island because I was just there. And I think I mentioned before that I talked to a lot of people on the ferry, saw my button, blah, blah, blah. They all can't believe that Narragansett has such a poor attitude towards education and libraries. So I started thinking about um, our position in taxes also because, you know, that's been a big theme here from the three of you saying that, you know, oh, we got to hold the line here and everything. Well, our tax right is in the bottom one quarter of Rhode Island cities and towns. So we are not overtaxed, overburdened by any stretch of the mean. I'm sure some people, I've already said, feel that they don't want to pay an iota more of taxes for anything. Uh, I did make some contact with the Block Island um, library, because their taxes are, they're in the bottom part too. And I wanted to see how big their library was, because I'm not very good with measurements. So they have a year-round population of about 1,000 people, and they have a library that is bigger than ours. It's 9,444 square feet, and they are in the process of expanding it because they feel that it cannot adequately meet the needs of the community. So our library is about 8,000 square feet, and we have 16,000 residents. So, you know, just do the math. It's, you know, how can you think we don't need, you know, a library that's accredited? How do you think we don't need a library that can fit more than 15 children in the children's area? And I was impressed that um, Block Island had a teen area, and they have computer stations, and they're not the exception. So if a little town with 1,000 residents can provide that kind of a library and be going through OLIS, because they said who wouldn't go through it, because they're going to get 40% back. But no, we don't want that. We're gonna, I don't know how we're gonna fix it, and that's what I haven't heard from the council. And Mr. Lima, you said, oh, I want a state-of-the-art library, you went to Tiverton. Um, I remember you during the election saying you were for it, obviously you've changed your mind. But what are we going to do to fix our library? It is totally inadequate for our town. Thank you, is there anyone else? Yes.
Karen Chapshaw I'm speaking for myself, but I'm also speaking for a lot of the seniors as I'm vice president of the seniors. As soon as I walk into the community center, I'm greeted with what's happening with the library. They all want to know what's happening with the library because a lot of the seniors rely on the library for intellectual, social, and emotional contacts and um, many of the programs, they're all free, by the way, and there's no charge for any of the programs. And there's a growing number of seniors in town. So I feel like you're throwing not only the library patrons, but the seniors under the bus. And also it was mentioned that it's too small for the children. The children have to, if they're under 10, they have to be accompanied by an adult. And we've also brought up the many um, security problems that are part of the library that we have to deal with. And as you know, the Board of Trustees is meeting for over 10 years, and we've been meeting with the required person from the State Library, um, State library Office, and we're working out a strategic plan. And for that just to be thrown in the wastebasket whimsically for a food court, I don't think any of you have seriously talked to the people that own restaurants and struggle to keep their business open year round. Now as a permanent resident, a year round resident, I don't go out of town and I think you're catering, the three of you are catering to the tourists, the part-time residents, and you throw the uh, full-time residents under the bus because we've all indicated in the vote 68% wanted the library to be increased in size. And the town has increased, I think, triple from when the library was originally built. And it seems to me like you're always picking, it's more important to worry about the liquor, the parties, than literacy and social stimulation and building the community. And I think the three of you are treating the library like a nasty, dirty word, and it should be part of building a community. What, what kind of community doesn't support its public library? It's really sad. And if the, te if the state chooses to close down the library, then what are we going to do? We'll be kicked out of the library system, as has been explained time and time again. There isn't a plan B, and we can't put it over on the highway at um, Kinney Farms or on Clark Road or as part of the school because you can't have a public library as part of the school because of public libraries have to allow anybody in and schools have to deal with issues what, like um, PDO files um, when they have a restraining order, parental issues, there's a lot of security issues, and you're not even addressing those, and you're treating the whole population that supports the library really poorly, yet you seem to have no thought in how you build a plan like throwing a, commu um, a food court into the middle of town as if that's going to solve any problems. Shame on you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? All right, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion approved five to zero. Smoke them if you